Okay, we're going to start with uh, I'm holding this up. next presentation here. Our other uh, organizer, Mark Carew. Um, Mark is associate professor at York University in the Department of Visual Art. What, it, what are they now? Visual Art and Art History. It changes every it changes so often that I just I don't remember. Visual Art and Art History, <laughs> time-based media. Um, Mark, what else can you, you can give me a bio? So, <laughs> so yeah. Mark, Mark used to be a pianist, and how he's a reformed pianist. Uh, we'll talk. I'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. Okay. Uh, I know you've been, you actually I know you've inspired a lot of your students and uh, you've been teaching. Some for of them are here. Seven yeah. seven years. Mark's been, uh, like, uh, <laughs> hands. Show of hands. No. Show of hands. But uh, anyways, Mark, I think has been he he founded this a sounder group uh, along with the uh, the other members. Uh, what did he call it? Tactical acoustic. What's Sonic sound? tactics. Sonic yeah. tactics. I guess. Uh, so yeah. So Mark is actually been, he's a, he's I want to say he's a good. Good professor, and <laughs> I don't know what else to say about you. <laughs> He's a good friend. Close, I know. It's, so, it's, close, it's, yeah. it's okay. So, <laughs> Mark's going to uh, riff on something that he actually, uh, I want to say this, he wrote something for another conference uh, uh, number called Running with Concepts, and he made a, a glossary. Which Christoph organized. Yeah, Christoph, Christoph over there. Organized. And he wrote what he calls a um, uh, preemptive, what was it, preemptive glossary uh, of technosonic control. Of technosonic yeah. control. Uh, and it's, he put it online. It's actually a really wonderful text. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the most interesting things I've read uh, in a while. Uh, but so, so we, it's, it's, it's on our <coughs> theculture.net. And I'm keep, keeping, uh, pers trying to push him to publish it <laughs> in some form sooner, uh, sooner than later. So we'll just start. All right. Thanks, Elbridge. <laughs> Uh, so I should say also that uh, that glossary started off as a blog posting, which came out of Christoph's thing, and then it sort of ended up in this format over here as a diagram, and then the diagram ended up in this thing I'm about to give you now. So it's it's going through a lot of different stages, and, and translations are occurring, and different things are getting accreted each time uh, that this thing changes changes form. So it's just getting weirder and weirder. But I'll, I trust you to notice that. Um, in December 1995, I found an unsigned note tacked to the student board in the music building at McGill University in Montreal. The note was most probably destroyed in a 2005 house fire. It stated in broken English that shortly after I had participated in a series of neurological tests around the ability of perfect pitch, a conversation had been overheard which suggested there was more to the experiment than met the ear. The note alleged that a neural program or algorithm could be implanted in subjects with substantial memorization capacities, who are also good hummers, though the modalities of this implantation remain utterly mysterious. A stimulus of some kind was to trigger an internal generation of melodies, which would then get stuck until externalized by humming, enabling them to virally circulate. Though supposedly the experimenters were unsure as to the effectiveness of this implantation, the, attention, the intention was that these generations would circulate as anticipations of corporately valenced melodies to come. This presentation follows from an attempt, admittedly provisional, to digest the implications of this still cryptic message, using the time-honored tradition of chronoportation to identify specific historical tropes and feed them forward into the world of sonic contingencies they have helped bring about. It transverses several iterations of attempts to process through various creative frameworks some of the still murky domains adumbrated by the haunting frequency of this aberrant missive, concretized by subsequent research into corporate technologies of viral sonic infestation. I adopt this method in order to situate this 1995 event as a linchpin in the elaboration of a network of inhuman, sonically abductive modalities instantiated by neuromarketing imperatives. To dismiss this note as the practical joke of a conspiratorial crank, would occult the opportunities it affords to induce effective revalencings of psychosonic capture operations into forces accelerated towards a future beyond capitalist instrumentalization. What concerns us here pertains to the domain of the phonoegregor, a spectral sonic cabal. Uh, and though you'll see in the diagram here, um, it appears split into upper and lower realms, um, the upper assembling elements constitutive of cyber capitalist circulation, the lower realms, techniques for intensifying, neutralizing, subtending such elements. Uh, but in reality, it's a totality of the parts of which can be equally appropriated by any phonomagus 
and employed to leverage the disposition of a given space-time. In other words, and at all times, the descriptive modes used below to frame contemporary cyber-affordant machinations can be simultaneously thought of as prescriptive invocations, taking as a given that any position which asserts that neurobiological abduction by capital is inevitable and hermetically foreclosed to any possible escape is insufficiently nuanced. The notion that art and its constitutive assemblages might become preemptive again, functionally operative instead of playing perpetual catch-up to the new avant-garde of our era, is also key. Edison is said to have expressed his fear of a shadowy phonic consortium gaining access to the disembodied, objectified words of an individual ripe for con contamination. His fear was well-founded. The schizophonic properties of recording technology have time and time again been appropriated by the few to gain power over the many. Propaganda dissemination, fireside chats, fake alien invasions, and real invasions induced by fake broadcasts. A particular subset of the latter characterized by the dubious machinations of the Arbenz effect. Proper to acts of metic or cunning intelligence involving the achievement of maximal results, in this case the 1954 resignation of the president of Guatemala, through minimal sonic means a leveraging of intensities familiar to scholars of Sun Tzu and his art of war. One might do well to also recall the brutally effective hyperphonochasmic operations targeting Democratic candidate Howard Dean in 2004, acoustically, electronically isolating the excitable politician from the crowd whose enthusiasm spurred him on in the first place. A case study of phono egregoric media manipulation reaping the advances made by Glenn Gould and his multiple microphone phonochasmic experiments from the mid-1970s. However, the phono egregor of note here is presumed to operate quite differently, exerting control through the mobilization of biosonic propensities of select individuals, musicians with perfect pitch who function as hosts for a continuous production of abductive melodic tropes through embodiment and externalization. Well, all true. In March 1995, I underwent a series of experiments geared towards uncovering the neural correlates of perfect pitch ability, later documented by the Radio Canada Television Network for their science program. The experiments involved a visualization of neural activity during pitch recognition exercises via positron emission tomography scan. As far as I knew, these experiments were exclusively conducted on this terrain though the additional abilities pertaining to memorization and humming had been correctly identified, they had not been flagged as experimental variables. The most compelling allegation concerned the implantation of tune-generating algorithms. The note resonated retrospectively with a very strange period beginning in April 1995, one month after the last experiment, in which curious melodies began to surface in my mind while transiting through various public spaces. These fragments of tunes emerged spontaneously like slogans, taglines, or streaks of graffiti appended to the particular structure being traversed. It wasn't quite like the phenomenon of cryptomnesis in which forgotten memories appear new on resurfacing, as these tunes were autonomous, paradoxical entities at once familiar yet indubitably alien. Regardless of their provenance, these melodies function as earworms, unexcisable sonic aberrations, which obsessively reiterate without conscious intent often ingrained by febrile attempts to recollect a particular musical passage, only furtively adumbrated, now long gone. It's 1995, long before the Shazam app and its robust fragment ID made such absurd mental efforts redundant. A common technique of earworm neutralization consisting in replacing the fragmented hook into its original context by listening to the entire piece from whence it came, thus recovering the integral whole, an overall structural picture in which every element is in its place, was singularly ineffectual. I could not ascertain the bug's affiliation with any previously extant entity. In other words, these worms were not synecdoches for a greater totality, but simply splinters which referred to nothing but themselves. The net effect of these inscrutable earworms was to induce an irrepressible urge to externalize, to hum the earworm out according to the principle of donation, in the hope of transferring it to another host with less propensity for phonographic incorporation, in whom it might be neutralized. In retrospect, I began to understand how the recipient might function as a kind of cog, a necessary temporary way station for a symbiont intelligence within a larger system. The need for a good hummer begins to make sense, externalization being integral to this machinic transfer. According to the tenets of cognitive capitalism in full swing by that time, the individual is enslaved by the capture of what Marx termed general intellect. Her affects, ideas, communicational skills vampirized, 
creative intensity sucked out and put to work. A bad individuation accomplished by drawing from virtual super earworm fund, singularizing and then re-injecting worms into the system for further development. An accelerated process made possible by the emergent modes of cyber affordance, proper to just in time cyber capitalism, which requires a system of instant feedback in order to minimize, minimize stockpiling and continue accumulation. It involves the constant extraction of information from virtually every aspect of an individual's life, operating to preempt future outside initiative by constantly predicting her next consumptive move, embedding the subject ever deeper. This actualization of the future in the present effectively, but stealthily, closes off any options which the system cannot afford, pretending to openness and convincing the subject of this while operating within a set of clearly delimited boundaries. Norbert Wiener's first order cybernetics aimed to predict the movement and behavior of enemy aircraft during World War II by continuously gathering information about the opponent and feeding it back into the system, gradually improving the latter's predictive ability. After the war, <clears throat> the Macy conferences provided the impetus for an improved second order cybernetics to be applied to the social realm in order to keep the death drive from exploding into actualization again. That's Gregory Bateson, anthropologist. The Bateson nudge is still employed today by the mavens of choice architecture, preemptively and strictly limiting possibility under the radar. The Mobius modality is the means by which an individual, a culture, and a society become system imminent. Imperceptible transitions from one condition to its diametrical opposite occur through a creeping process, the increments of which appear to confirm the status quo in absence of palpably discrete change. Only in retrospect is one able to discern the monumental flips that have taken place, by which time the new conditions have become normalized into fact. Noise, far from being a nuisance to the system, is in fact essential to periodically restart it. The public spreading of inscrutable melodic tags might be better understood in terms of later developments in priming. Indispensable to the cyber-affordant model, a preparation through background introduction of information which, which becomes creepingly pervasive, such that the figure or product that eventually emerges against it appears inevitable. Back to memory. Musicians given the mnemonic imperatives of the profession are already skilled at storing phonographic incorporations, internalized auditory totalities of extended duration, most often of a musical nature, which can be recalled at will, instantiations assuming the form of internal playback. Details regarding frequency, rhythm, duration, dynamics, timbre, and associated effects are all internally audible and accurately reproduced on cue. Auditory resolution increases dramatically among individuals with perfect pitch abilities. A particular instantiation of the incorporation will often be triggered by an environmental factor, linguistic, musical, affective, which engenders inner listening, a process known more commonly as phonemesis. Badly suggests that recorded material might be incorporated by a sub-vocal rehearsal process, which continuously refreshes the memory trace through the use of one's inner voice. This process appears indispensable in extending the length of the incorporation beyond that afforded by the capacities of the phonological store, which can only maintain three to four seconds of material in active memory before decay sets in. It still remained unclear why particular fragments became obsessively lodged. A return to the idea of noise as that which tethers one more securely to a cybernetic system, deviations that might be self-generated. Oh. Oh, we are. Okay. We're back. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, what's the sound here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hacks. Of course. Okay. Let's see if we can get this back in some kind of form. No, not that. <laughs> <laughs> This is what it must feel like to listen to me. 
<laughs> okay. Cascading, uh, chaos. Hyper, cas chaos. hyper chaos. <laughs> Someone's trying to shut you down. Yeah, clearly. Clearly. He's got to. No, the US. I've got to. Do, <laughs> <laughs> well. do it properly. You're good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, this is oh, stupid. So let me tell you about Mark. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we can. We may be missing some visuals here, but um, oh well. In the interest of time, I'm not going to delay this any further. I think you'll get an idea of what I'm trying to say here. Maybe. OK. Um, the day before leaving for the country, I watched a 70s TV movie entitled Strange Homecoming, which you will not see, which included a scene with an oddly memorable musical theme. Away from my hypomnesic environment, I spent an entire week of attempting, through various mental procedures, to recover it, to surface it to no avail. Back home, I maniacally scrubbed over the same music again and again until the music began looping in my mind autonomously. Though the incongruity of this particular theme fostered the fixation, it could not have become ingrained without my help. A medic, cunning intelligence would be impotent without an understanding how, of how one is implicated in the mechanisms of one's own entrapment. The incongruity index expresses the degree of deviation from a normative, melodic, harmonic, rhythmic condition, which induces excess cognition on the part of the listener, absorbed in the effort of identifying the anomalous nature of the mysterious event. This surplus effort to pull back perceived incongruity into an existing category effectively induces the earworm, which is why sonic branders, inspired by the work of Dr. James Calaris, among others, are interested in mathematizing a particular hook's deviation in order to more effectively abduct. As a necessary correlate, the average amount of repetitions needed to naturalize a deviation depending on its incongruity index must also be determined. This naturalization process is tantamount to the psychic half-life of the deviation, its gradual withdrawal into an expanding virtual background where, though it can do no more direct harm, it can nonetheless contribute to nudging qua curtailing future possibility. Types of deviation include an awkward melodic leap, initially unattractive, an unexpected harmonic modulation, rhythmic asymmetries and foreshortenings, etc. These anomalies are often integrated by the conscious mind without undue effort and without lasting parasitic effect, which is why the magical art of deviation requires constant practice and update according to current sensible distributions of cultural matter. Now I have another device here, which I will attempt to uh, get something to come out of. Down a little bit. I had no recourse but to design a recontouring machine. Given that ironic mental control, as theorized by Wegner, only redoubles the earworm embedding. It functions as a temporary contingent set of local operations which feverishly populate a virtual realm of potential in order to de-emphasize the centrality of an offending earworm. This machine abstracts the contour from its original incarnation in order to calculate deviations which implement alterations on chiefly melodic, harmonic, rhythmic levels. It works within the purview of fractal listening, of which more shortly, and is fueled by the modalities of deaf recording, a prophylactic method suppressing the production of deliberately memorable gestalts by recording in isolation each line of a given textural totality. Recontouring, ungestalting machines have been known to backfire chiefly due to insufficiently rigorous deviation design. A too acute deviation from parametric boundaries risks generating a new object of obsession for the listener, unaware that a new earworm is about to ingress. So this is the set of 84 recontourings of the Strange Homecoming theme, the thing if you didn't see, one following the other consecutively, as if looping back to the beginning, yet each variation is subtly different. But not so different that it becomes an earworm itself, so it's a very tricky operation to kind of do something that's sort of the same but not so individual that it becomes something that, again, you try and pull back and learn and uh, ingrain deliberately. So with this in mind, I remembered that not all of the self-generated melodies had successfully lodged themselves. Only those with a sufficient incongruity index managed to gestate until expulsion. The next stage was crucial. The inhuman generations of the recombinant tune machine made human through humming 
bodily re reappropriation, reboning. An effectively valence, flexibilized, embodied hum lubricates the transfer to unsuspecting temporarily adjacent individuals. Glenn Gould attributed his increasing incapacity to accurately perform a given musical passage to the overwhelming influence of foreclosing mentations, preemptions of the future, the anticipation of difficulties ahead in a given timeline, physically blowing back in the present. Gould's solution to this debilitating condition consisted in obliterating any acoustical evidence of ongoing physical efforts, even those generated internally, masking them by the mast effects of multiple vacuum cleaners, televisions, and radios operating at full blast. Once a properly embodied relationship with the passage in question was restored, so was its acoustical result. Some accounts indicate that the simple reboning of phonographic incorporation by humming is enough to displace it, but others suggest that this form of repeated externalization has little long-term effect on the integrity of the inner recording. In my case, the accretion of a number of debilitating, self-perpetuating, failure-inducing algorithms induced, accelerated, the demise of my career as a contemporary music interpreter, unable to negotiate the affordance model of the linear concert ritual still predicated on structural listening, a collapsing crystallization of past, present, future much favored by Adorno. <laughs> too bad, that was, a good, that was a good slide, too. There you go. Oh, but it's not playing. Uh, we can commiserate later. Um, it's whatever. Actually, you know what? I might actually be able to find a... I don't want to be ridiculous again, but let's just... You just do it. I just have to do it. I'm sorry. Really sorry. Is this a yeah. video? Yeah. It's a video, and hopefully I can find some way of massaging this Fakakta machine into something of a reasonable response. I'm sorry. Okay, here we go. And this is from uh, 2000, actually. If it plays. <laughs> My brain was already accelerating towards a model which had not yet arrived. A few years later, after the onset of this algorithmic condition, which could not seemingly be put to any productive use, I attempted an exorcism of these embedded modalities via the fractal plane out of infralegibly distinct contrapuntal entanglements, one indistinguishable from the next. A rather desperate attempt constituted by a permanent refusal to settle on any possible object of obsession, trying to outwit mental melodic production through a logic of constant rupture and body-mind short-circuiting. A failed attempt. I'm here today because of this, because of this failure. Oh. <laughs> okay, is this a summary here? This is my, uh, this is my uh, teacher, uh, the teacher in me, you know. Did, did you get it? <laughs> okay. All right, here we go. Um, phonographic incorporations are often brought on by latching. The Squire number, named after the founder of the music corporation, Muzak Corporation, Major General George Squire, expresses the degree of deviation between a given recording and its phonographic incorporation in a given subject. Latching is part of the overall notion of entrainment, a mode by which a subject attunes to environmental factors, often manifesting through the sinking of involuntary bodily movements with adjacent rhythms. Incidentally, entrainment characterizes egregoric collective synchronization as well. The latching process will occur most often without one being aware of it, given a generalized passivity towards music's schizophonic ubiquity, and frequently comes to consciousness retrospectively after the original signal has dissipated. The simple realization of the just heard sound's disappearance may internally reinstate it by automatically inducing the playback of an extant phonographic incorporation. A significant enough deviation between the subject's incorporation and its analog playing back in the air may foster on becoming aware of the discrepancy, a feeling Keats might have described as embarrassment, a surreptitious coming upon oneself, a momentarily unsettling non-self-concordance. Raymond Scott's 1964 set of LPs, Soothing Sounds for Baby, consisted for the most part of extended repetitive rhythmic structures, was marketed as music to put your child to sleep. You see the schizophrenia already underway in uh, 12 months. 
In fact, portions of his work may well be and may well have been used to investigate latching potential in very small infants temporarily caught in the gap between conscious and unconscious mind. Cybercapitalist power has harnessed the autonomic valences of entrainment by indexing it to individual consumption, thereby stripping it of its potential to mobilize collective energy. Nevertheless, any publicly disseminated stimulus risks fomenting unlikely bonds between individuals mutually interpolated by it, who may choose to negotiate and overpower it together through discrepant reappropriations or reboning's. However, concomitant with the gradual substitution of the jingle slogan with the brand password, the phono egregore had developed a technique of preemptive self-distortion. In part, it's a rhythmic thing. It's like the Raymond Scott thing. It's got the <laughs> entrainment going for it. I'm losing my slides here. I was thinking of dropping the slides. Uh, in part, expedited by the 1989 release of John Oswald's Plunder Phonics CD, in which the materials of well-known pop icons were subjected to disfiguring maneuvers occasioning potentially disastrous and irreversible image damage. In the wake of exacerbated sensory overload, where time becomes increasingly suspect, audio branding researchers arrived at the conclusion that if they invested sonic sigils with capacities to absorb distortion from all sides and still retain integrity, any future attempt at co-optation by resistant forces could be preemptively forestalled. I then understood why the phono egregore was not content to simply implant a robustly immutable earworm, but instead a program for generating embodied ear variations. It was preemptive self-distortion in full fluorescence, correlated to the subtleties of the incongruity index. Instead of running the risk of a melodic trope decaying into ineffectiveness, better to constantly induce variations displaying sufficient incongruity to force automatic pullback and redoubled implantation. When the eventual figure would emerge in the form of an advertisement, it would appear as new and yet distinctly primed by a multiplicity of same but different entities. This might explain the success of the phono egregore at covering its tracks, avoiding a too crude ground-to-figure correlation. Which brings up another fault line in the cyber affordant paradigm the possibility of ruination by over-identification, in which too rapid dispersal blows back, prematurely terminating the future effectiveness of a particular viral entity. This was acutely evident in 2000 with the rapid ascent and quick oversaturation of Kylie Minogue's Can't Get, get You Out of My Head, <laughs> and now it's in your head. The title itself reflective of a cavalier arrogance too sure of its own abductive potency. One should never underestimate the potential of bad connections. <laughs> Something else going here? Ejection from the cybernetic folds of the perpetually preemptive phono egregore can be equally accelerated by the strategic deployment of psychedelic adjacencies. This making manifest to the mind, literally psyche plus delos, is a ubiquitous property of the colloidal electrification of contemporary society in which perpetually recombinant signals are convulsively distributed in a given environment, instantiating temporary relationships with one another by haphazard temporal and spatial proximities. The Baker's Doe analogy is fitting. Two extreme points become adjacent after a mathematically determinable number of folds. Terms need only hang together in the same general space-time for factual coalescence to occur. Indeed, the distracted attention which constitutes the primary perceptual modality of the 21st century enables new unsuspected entities to spring into effectiveness through a form of niche, a mutual imbrication, folding in of elements whose genetic structures are subliminally compatible but overtly incongruent, a mutant rhythm analysis simultaneously fracturing and resynthesizing. And this is what I call a double earworm induction. It's uh, the attempt to ingrain one thing through another semi-permanently. Uh, and it's uh, Al Green's uh, Still in Love with You with the theme from Love Story. So. But you'll notice the uh, incredible synchronicities. And I did nothing but line them up at the beginning of the file. Everything else sort of takes care of itself. It's also an example of this kind of leveraging capacity of cunning intelligence, which says, okay, not to say that I'm cunning right now, but that you can achieve maximal results by very, very minimal manipulations. That's kind of... So, anyway, I don't have time to do maximal uh, variations anyway. So, minimal to achieve the maximal. A metastatic spread of correlated entities may constitute an indigestible challenge to the stealthy incorporation of hungry worms. 
It's not surprising that William S. Burroughs' insistence on the functionalizing of art and its capacity to produce changes in reality was deliberately downplayed. Genesis Peorage recounts the story of Burroughs casting a spell on an eatery that had maligned him by walking back and forth outside of it while playing at barely audible level of recording cutting in violent sounds to the sounds of the restaurant. A few weeks after the action, the joint closed without explanation. With the volatility and accessibility of schizophonic practices thus exposed, it was deemed preferable to diffuse Burroughs within the equivocating realm of postmodern stylistic experimentation, rather than encourage any mass dissemination of the principles of technomagical correlation. And it's also no wonder that rather than the promotion of the convulsive mining of unprecedented capacities to induce synchronicities made possible by this colloidal electrification, we have to instead weather one critique after another deploring an irretrievable loss of attention and concentration, a lacrimose pining for an empty category, considering William James' reminder of how focus and distraction are perpetually complicating each other. Mere phono propaganda, I assume. Oh, and the tunes, in fact, synchronize perfectly with the next one. In a sedimental mood is a work of densified adjacency making, convulsively reordering a set of concatenated variables to elude the abductive properties of memorability, while at the same time remaining compelling in the moment. If you'll let me know when I'm over. 30 now? This returns us back to the fractal listening impelled by the recontouring machine. A perceptual state in which one is unable to categorically decide whether one some form of recursion is underway. In a fractal listening experience, an effective intuition of non-repetition is perpetually undercut by a cognitive ratification of identity. The experience oscillates between local specifics, deviations with various capacities to be registered as deviations, and a shadowy shape-shifting totality, constantly updated by information from this transient matter, forever deferring its termination to a graspable gestalt. This febrile unresolution almost inevitably engenders temporal anomalies or folds which occasion a loss of teleological integrity and a more constant interpenetration of past, present, and future, an accumulating virtual field of potential against which the perception of change is constantly leveraged. This modality takes into account the inevitable process by which repetition pressures incongruity to reverse into a new form of congruity through a gradual ablation of idiosyncrasy. It therefore must remain constantly on the move. Anadumbration is the process which affects this perpetual postponement of any unifying perceptual paradigm through the feverish shuffling of parameters. Incorporating Husserl's fear of adumbration by detourning it, English artist Norman Wilkinson originated one of the most notorious applications of anadumbration via dazzle camouflage. And if I had the images, I could show you. A technique involving the painting on vessels of bands of stripes of contradictory size and directionality. This is World War I period which impede the ability of the opponent to gather a coherent perspective on the approaching craft and therefore to act accordingly. Anadumbration is a useful technique when attempting to defeat the listener's propensity to close off perception when confident that an experience has been properly identified, categorized, captured. The ungestalting deviations of the anadumbration function not to pull you out of a system, but to maintain you squarely within it while preventing conscious seizure of its modalities. It keeps you system imminent through a rapid containment of discrepant surfaces by counting on the smooth functioning of the Freudian secondary process by which a subject backtracks from an incoherent first impression into a rational second order justification. Uh, and this last piece I want to play for you today is um, a piece called Adam, Adam Braid 57. Um, and this is a piece that generates 57 variations um, on the theme of the Manchurian Candidate, which is a whole other set of references which I won't get into, including the number 57, which actually comes from a bottle of Heinz 57 ketchup, which uh, the corrupt senator sees on a table when he's asked how many communists there are in the Senate. It says, 57. Um, so this piece involved the generation of 57 variations to dislodge the centrality of an offending earworm, to place the original into a larger context, thereby demoting it. Um, these are chronocrypsic operations tasked with time camouflage, asymmetrically folding discrepant temporalities while donating service impressions of a wholly illusory kind. While dazzle camouflage interrupts the continuity of a surface, an adumbration interrupts the continuity of time. In the case of this work, engendering wormholes through rewind, fast forward, stutter, and drop-off procedures. 
Differential blending in which parts of the figure become indistinguishable from the background also works effectively in the time domain, where the latest iterations blend unpredictably with the evolving increasingly grotesque and unsustainable ground accumulated in memory. An understanding of the shifty time dependence of the Mobius modality leaves open the potential for putting it to use through revalencing operations, differential amplifications, the recovery of occulted valences from history, using the unadumbrated past to get to the future faster. Uh, Nick Land describes the task of the hyperstitional cyberneticist as closing the circuit of history by detecting the convergent waves that register the influence of the future on its past. And I'm going to just skip to um, the end. Um, so I spent a little bit of time talking about this kind of reduction of time through branding to this kind of this thing that is not really concerned with time anymore because we don't have time. And so the idea is to generate a kind of splinter which is temporally valence, psychoacoustically valence, so that even before you have time to kind of internalize the thing, you're already captured by it. Um, a chronophobic individual is all about fear of time at this point. Um, a clear, in the parlance of Paris Scientologue L. Ron Hubbard, thinks in instantaneous bursts without the ramblings of an inner voice without reflection. Clement Greenberg's formalist Augenblick, the totality of the artwork is accessible in the blink of an eye, coterminous with the missing half second before cognition takes things up. Pierre Schaeffer, a French telecommunications engineer and anti-nuclear activist, believed the world could be altered by coding its sounds into the musical realm, developing the technique of reduced listening to empty out the semantic register of sound, the linguistically corrosive, while maintaining its effective psychosomatic valences intact. Like the post-Darmstadt tabula rasa generation of composers, but in a far more powerful fashion for having the insight to employ the technology of his time as medium for psychic transformation, Schaeffer sought to zero out in order to fill, this time squarely within the stabilizing machine of music. Maybe Jacques Attali was right after all, in alleging that cyclical transformations in the sacrificial order of music anticipate the social world to come. Schaeffer's particular preemption was to plagiarize Attali's theory of la lettre, flipping it from descriptive to prescriptive, and formalize a new totalizing musicalized affordance model from the bottom up, which would help induce the future through the transformation and regulation of natural sounds to channel the impersonal inhumanist death drive into homeostatic equilibrium. What Schaeffer didn't know was that the cyber capitalist Fono Egregor, already anticipating the decline of Fordism, was seeking such a set of schizophonic modulatory modalities to further its capture operations. Because the wresting of music from its dalliance with affordance is a prerequisite to unshackling its awesome productive po powers, a keen understanding of its neurophysiological correlates becomes a key component within musical epistemic acceleration. Much of this is conjecture, as I said at the beginning, but it is a particular form of conjecture with actualization capacities. I assure you, the subliminal hum of machinic earworm generation continues to do its work inside me, whether or not this model is ultimately expedient. If anything is to be retained, it is the sheer fungibility of the modalities under investigation, reversible and exchangeable at a moment's notice. Paradromic processes running alongside those fostered by the military entertainment complex can take ample advantage of temporal leakages induced by chronoportative modes, hijacking cyber-afforded molar, weak, prime synchronicities to ferret out other, more intransigent, less suspected molecular synchronicities. This detection becomes all the more imperative in an era in which a surfeit of affect induces a surfeit of synchronicities, a surfacing of phonoegregoric emanations. Hazardous connections caught on the fly, intensified, retrospectively confirming pre-existing aberrations. Background temporarily made foreground through transversal glitching. A molecular listening process may hold the key, detecting continuities occluded by the parcelization of time operated by the Mobius modality, while isolating accidents, discrepancies, misevaluations, vagrant concretions that might be productively exploited. Listening is already a parallel parasitic process in a world of distributed impulses, marginal to a myriad of activities, subtly bending them while driving out resting places, temporary space times in which de reification procedures attain their maximal potency. These premises point towards the constitution of an emergent phono egregore, a psychic expression of collective will an autonomous power hostile to, while surpassing its asphyxiating earthbound diminutive, a free-floating affect with synchronizing propensities, accelerated by algorithmically fueled network technologies, 
dedicated towards ejecting from circular causality by leveraging music's occult proclivities in the name of an as yet dimly adumbrated futurity. <laughs> Mine is And minus the visuals, too. <laughs> Do we have any time for anything? We have about one minute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I uh, timed it so precisely. But, yeah. but you have some technical errors. I have technical glitches, yeah. What's part of it? Uh, take a couple questions and then... Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Is this the piece for which you had a glass away? Uh, yeah. That, yeah. That was <laughs> yeah, this is the piece, yeah. The, the words, right? I think what the glossary we were seeing in the slides. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the With some that. additional ones. But this piece is actually the piece that that sort of got the glossary started. So, I mean, it, it's again, it's this idea of starting from the kind of irreducible aspects of practice, which, you know, you can't theorize, that just happened through the, you know, it's like what Ilya Ayash talks about, the writing, you know, the writing of the, uh, uh, of the uh, um, you know, prices in the stock market, right? It's this kind of, you, you can abstract it and imagine it, but, but really it's in the writing where you discover things that you would never be able to discover in any other way. So I kind of work that way rather than work from a top down kind of thing and then find a way to, I don't know, apply the theory. Not that this is a theory of any kind, but it's a set of disconnected modalities that may or may not and somehow, somehow function together or not. Could you talk about magic in the, like, I've been, I haven't been here for the whole conference, but I've heard it come up there. Um, and you mentioned sigils, and you mentioned um, casting spells, and you seem to think of, I don't know, I'm telling you if this is wrong, but you seem to be thinking of cybernetics as this top-down, um, capitalist um, module, or like a structure, whereas magic, well, I mean, for, for me, in, in so many ways, like, you know, the way in which capitalism has kind of entered this neuro, neurological phase, then, you know, we're neuromarketing, you know, if you just look at the pro proceeds of any conference of the Society for Consumer Psychology, you realize that the kind of minutia that, you know, are the areas of study that are being funded, you know, by these huge corporations into finding ways of preempting any kind of thought. Um, and these, the, you know, like the, the most anodyne, asinine aspects, like, you know, the kind of music that, that you hear uh, when you're put on hold on, on a call center, right? And it's trying to, like, really analyze every little detail of that to try and figure out ways of massaging that. And, and, and often it happens, as I said, without our awareness of it. And that, to me, is a kind of magic already. There's something that's going on there that, um, that as artists, we can't sort of approach from, you know, we can't sort of grab it, you know, in a way that's in any way um, rational. We have to kind of play the game uh, that the Foner Egregore is also playing, which is to kind of subtend that in some other more... Uh, more magical way. So, I mean, if, if, if the avant-garde of our era, which is the military entertainment complex, is functioning to, you know, to preempt our very thought processes, to, you know, cut them off before they even get started, then we have to develop other techniques. And for me, magic is a way of entering into that other world, I guess. <laughs> if I say any more, you know. In fact, it was Eldritch who outed me as a magician uh, in his book, so... <laughs> so I, I, the only reason I can actually talk about any of this is because he's already, you know, effectively outed me. You should all read his book, by the way. Can you just talk a bit, about, a bit more about the piano video and specifically um, the ways that that project failed? Like, were you thinking of it as an aesthetic failure, as a kind of failure along these lines of eradicating uh, these pernicious earworms, uh, both? Both. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, on a kind of really, you know, personal level to try and eradicate these things, the piece kind of took that sort of form. But, of course, on a whole other level, it became performance art. I mean, it was this whole other, you know, because to the person sitting, no, no, one, no one who was at that performance had any clue that this performance was connected to that, you know, yeah. that was initially motivated by that. So what, what, what came across was then this kind of act of sort of, 
you know, strange theatricality, you know, mm -hmm. strange mannerisms. But in fact, those were all being kind of processed by this attempt to kind of extirpate this stuff. So it sort of functioned on a more, I don't know, on another kind of more dramatic level, I guess, um, for the people sitting in, 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 in the hall who were obviously not aware of what was actually going on internally. Yeah. Why didn't it work? <laughs> Why, why did I, I think I missed why it didn't work to, oh, uh, to eradicate the new one. Oh, I, I don't know. No idea. <laughs> it and just Is it a didn't. process that you think needs to be tuned but could work? Or I'm not sure. I think... Well, I think I think what what was what I was trying to get at with that piece was you know to to try and find ways of short circuiting to, to try and develop modalities of stopping things before they get started, but um, in the end I realized that it might be better to actually use those propensities in more productive ways. So to instead instead of fighting them, to actually accept that these things are happening and you weren't being cunning enough. How can we use how can I use those things you know to produce other kinds of effective viral sort of you know, valences. So, so I kind of, that was, that was a while ago. I was still naive. It was still, it was still um, too close to the original event for me to actually have any kind of distance from it. You didn't it. have the beard yet. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> it. It helps, really. Now you, you can probably wrap it up. Yeah. Just from the bottom.